Uh, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. He has called you to be here. We are here for Him, by Him, through Him, because of Him. It is so good to be here with you. Uh, we've got a big week this week. There's a big day going on today. Uh, just a couple of things that you may or may not uh, have become aware of. Uh, this afternoon there's going to be a fall festival over at the Davis Farm. Uh, that's from 4 to 5.30. Sam Junkin texted me and he's like, be sure to mention that because August just gets up for this kind of thing. And, and so that's, uh, she said they had 50 pumpkins. There's going to be pumpkin carving, pizza, s'mores, hayride, all the fun stuff. That's at the Davis Farm. If you need an address to that, uh, let me know and I'll get that for you. And then after that, um, at 7 o'clock, they've got worship night. They're not doing it at bungalows this week. They're doing it over at the church. Uh, they had some, I don't know, it's, it's tough to lug that equipment around, I think, is one of the things. And Sam said, I've not looked forward to a night like this in a long time. And so uh, that's going to be a big thing at the Methodist church tonight at 7. There's a couple of things going on today. Uh, yesterday, big thanks are in order. Uh, so I see Wes. Um, Bart is, is with Marvin. Um, Marvin that comes with Wes works at the food bank with him. He's fallen down. He said he was in the floor since yesterday, Miss Glenda. Um, they, they went to his house this morning and he had not been able to get out of the floor. So y'all pray for Marvin. Um, Bart's with him right now. But uh, Wes and Bart, um, Brad, Abigail, Rusty was our fearless leader, um, pulling together a service day yesterday, helped out uh, several of our ladies, um, Miss Robin, Miss Bonnie, uh, Miss Redonia. Um, that was a good day of service there. Um, Abigail was a, a good boss lady. Thank you, Abigail. Uh, she made sure we were doing what we need to be doing. I got to the backyard and, at Miss Bonnie's, and um, the guys had her blowing her own leaves, though, so I don't know what that was about. Uh, she said they paid her to do it. I don't know about that. But anyway, that was a good day. Uh, thanks to all those that came out for that. And uh, the, we, some of y'all uh, brought Kleenex to take to the schools, to the teachers. Um, thank you to all those who brought that. I know Brad and Edie and Abigail, uh, Jill worked real hard putting stickers on those yesterday for taking them to the teachers. Uh, so thanks to all those who have, who have brought that together. And then um, I forgot to mention this when it happened, but Miss Glenda, these are beautiful. Miss Bonnie, those as well. Thank y'all for for um, keeping us looking good up here. And then this past week, I just want to recognize a very special lady, Miss Glenda, uh, came up to the building and uh, just, it was a beautiful, beautiful thing. Bart uh, baptized her here. Uh, would you stand up, Miss Glenda? We, we, we love you, Miss Glenda. Yes, yes, put, <laughs> yes, it's in the, big, in the bulletin. Um, just every single weight we have, the joy of being baptized into Him and putting that in God's hands. It was just a privilege to, to be. Love you, Miss Glenda. So, all right, this, this is just a good day uh, to be together, to be church. It's just, aren't you so thankful for church? So thankful for family. Uh, just, we have a place to stand in this world. We, we don't go through it wondering how to make heads or tails of it. And we, we have an anchor. We have a family. And that's just so awesome to be here with you. We are going to talk this morning about giving it your best. Um, before we do, though, you can see we, I, I got a video this morning. I don't do a lot of media, um, but this morning I thought it was important. We got a video, and then we'll talk about uh, doing our best. So, Rusty, if you would roll that. The race at one elementary school that really moved us. A little boy so determined to stay in the race, even when it looked like he couldn't make it any further. Oh, timers, I'm going to just say go. You ready? It was race day at Colonial Hills Elementary School near Columbus, Ohio. Go! They were off, and right there at the back of the pack, 11-year-old Matt Woodrum determined to run with the rest of the class. Go, Maddie! But it wasn't long before Matt was trailing a bit. He had cerebral palsy and was told he didn't have to run that race, that he could sit it out. But Matt wanted it. Making his way around that track, his proud mom videotaping the whole thing. 
suddenly Matt starts to slow down, starts to struggle. And watch the left corner of your screen. Right there, that's gym teacher John Blaine walking toward Matt on the field. Soon, some gentle coaching right by his side. Come on, buddy! That gym teacher would stay right there the rest of the race. And then something else. Suddenly, his classmates begin to notice. And one by one, they start making their way toward Matt, too. The crowd is swelling beside him. And so does their chant. Matt rounding that final bend, his entire class in tow. Every step of the way, then his rally. Teachers watching at the end, the cheers at the finish line. He did it. Afterward, his mother could hardly find him in the midst of all of his fans. A high five there and a hug. That race now going viral on the internet, and Matt told me just today on the phone what that moment was like when that entire class was behind him. It was tiring, but it really helped when my classmates and my coach and everybody warned me. It was really encouraging. Mom, who was there taping it all, and Dad, who saw it later, both so proud tonight. I couldn't have been more proud of my son. It was very heartwarming. Oh Dad proud, and so are we. And in fact, Matt told me if he had to race all again tomorrow, he would do it for sure. 808,000 hits now on that video on the internet. For the record, I had something. Uh, I heard some of y'all got a little cold back there, too. Um, I love that. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Giving your best. First, I got a story for you. Uh, there was a man, Joe, we'll call him, got out of work in a, in a hard time. A lot of people were out of work. Joe was looking for something, and he got to the point where he'd take anything, anything. And he was going, employer to employer, nobody had anything. Finally went to the zoo, and um, y'all have anything? No, we don't have anything. He was about to walk away, but um, the man said, you know what, though? That there is one thing, and I, this is crazy. I don't even know if it's worth mentioning to you, but our gorilla died last week, and you wouldn't believe how hard it is to get a gorilla. They're they're actually pretty expensive, and take some time. And oh, this is crazy. But if you would want to wear a gorilla suit and be a gorilla for us, I guess I could pay you to do that. And Joe's like, well, I mean, there's there's nothing else. I guess. I guess I could be a gorilla. And so Joe dresses up in the gorilla suit a little bit before the zoo opens every day, gets in the cage, and, and day after day he pretends to be a gorilla and actually kind of has some fun with it. And, you know, just gets to run around all day and he loves seeing the kids' faces and comes to enjoy being a gorilla. Well. That goes on for some time, but then one day he just so happened to be swinging around up in his, in his cage and he accidentally falls over into the lion's cage. And there's half a second where there's a decision to be made because, you know, he doesn't want to blow his cover. This is his job, but it's not really a decision at all. You know, this, this, can't, this can't happen. So he starts to call out for help, call out for help. At which point the lion looks at him and says, buddy, if you don't shut up, we're both going to lose our jobs. <laughs> Identity problems. I think when we start to talk about giving our best, and particularly in the way that we serve the Lord and what we do for Him in our service to Him, a lot of it eventually gets back to identity problems. Who am I? Well, what am I doing for God? I mean, like, really, what's, what's at the core of it? Why do I do what I do for God? What's motivating me to serve God? You know, a lot of times we can serve God, but out of the wrong identity. And somewhere along the way it breaks down and we wonder why did I have problems serving God? Well, it's because I was serving out of the wrong identity. Uh, let me just put a list before you because there's a big difference between having a job for God and having a ministry that's gifted by the Spirit. It's a big difference by just having a job in the church or having a Spirit gifted ministry. Let me just read this list to you and see if we can pick out the difference. 
If I'm serving to earn God's approval, then it's a job. I've got a job. If I'm serving in joy because I know that I already have God's approval, I have a ministry. If I'm serving just well enough to get by, then I have a job. If I'm serving to the best of my ability, I have a ministry. If I'm motivated to serve by a sense of guilt and obligation, then I have a job. But if I'm motivated to serve by a sense of gratitude and love, then I have a ministry. If my sense of self is tied to my performance, how well I do, well then I have a job. But if my sense of self is grounded in Jesus, no matter how my performance shakes out, then I'm freed up for ministry. If my concern is success, then I have a job. If my concern is faithfulness, then I have a ministry. If I can't stop serving, and this was, this was a big one for me, if I can't stop serving the church because it will fall apart if I stop and because I'll let people down, then I just have a job. But if I know that God's church is much bigger than me and I have the freedom to serve as I'm able, then I have a ministry. It's hard to get excited about a job, but it's hard to get excited about anything else when you have a ministry. So I would dare say as we prepare to talk about giving our best, a lot of it starts right here in my identity. How do I look at my service in relation to who I am before God, what He's called me to be, what He has called me to do? Who am I? What am I about? Because service to God that's just viewed as a job, it quickly becomes burdensome. We burn out of that. But a God-given ministry that is sustained by the Spirit as I walk in the Spirit, that feels like life. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, Paul says that we are His workmanship. We were created in Christ Jesus for good works that He prepared, that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is who we are. Our works, our service is a big part of who we are. We were created with that in mind. God prepared it before we were even here. He set these things up for us that we might serve Him. And when we walk in this service, when we walk in works, we walk in life. If you want to turn to Matthew chapter 25, that's going to be our text for this morning. Uh, it's a very well-known parable there in verses 14 through 30. We have the parable of the talents. And you may have heard of this parable before. Just a, a quick summary. It says that the kingdom is it's like a master that goes away on a long journey. But before he leaves, he brings three of his servants to himself, and he entrusts them with his resources. He gives one man five talents, he gives another one two, he gives another one one, and then he leaves and he goes on a journey. And after a time, he comes back, and he calls his servants in to give an account of their dealings. And the man that was given five talents says, look, I worked and I, I traded and I got five more here. This is yours. And, and the master says, you have done very well. You're good and you're a faithful servant. Because you have served well, I'm going to give you even more. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And likewise, the man that was given two talents, when his master comes back, he's traded and he's, he's come with two more. And again, you're good, you're a faithful servant. Because you've been faithful with a little bit, much will be given to you. And, and enter into the joy of your Lord. But then there was the man that was given one talent. And um, he didn't do anything with it. Matter of fact, he was very fearful. He took that one talent and he buried it in the ground. And when his master came back, he said, I knew, I knew that you were a hard man. Implication, I dare not lose what you gave me. I went and I hit it in the ground just to make sure that I at least had that one to give back to you. And here you have what's yours. And the master said, you knew I was hard? Did you really know that? If, if that's the way that you thought about me, then at least you could have gone and put it in the bank. And when I came back, you would have had interest to deliver. But as it is, take that man's one talent and give it to the one that has five and that man, that wicked and slothful servant should be cast out. And Jesus tells this 
parable. He tells it actually as the, th the third parable in a string of three parables. He's kind of been painting our image of what the kingdom is going to be like. He's coming to Jerusalem here. It will be the last time that he comes into Jerusalem. He knows his days are numbered. He's gone into the temple and cleansed the temple. He's taken his disciples up on the Mount of Olives. He's told them about the coming days. And then he starts to give them parables. What is that great return of the Master going to be like? What is it going to be like when He brings His kingdom in its fullness? And He starts telling parables. And the first one is, it's going to be like a Master that's gone off and He comes back. And when He comes back, the servants, He didn't have any respect for the fact that the Master would be returning at, at any time. And so He began to be abusive and beat the other servants. And and he began to be gluttonous and, and to drink with the drunkards. And it's almost like he just had no awareness that the master was coming back at some time that he didn't know. And Jesus tells this parable to say, when we live in the light of the kingdom, when we live knowing that Jesus is coming back, we purify our lives. The flesh trends towards uh, drunkenness and, and abusiveness, running over people just to get what we want. He said, no, no, when you live in light of the coming kingdom, you purify your lives. You don't live like that. He, take, he tells the next parable, the parable of the virgins, those that prepared for the coming bridegroom and had plenty of oil in their lamps and, and oil to spare, and those that had just enough. And it's almost as though he's saying, the coming kingdom can't just be a casual interest to you. Every now and then, oh yeah, I'm, I'm looking towards that, but you don't really make any preparation for it. No, the coming kingdom is something that we dedicate our lives to in prayerful watchfulness. We, we deeply prepare for the coming kingdom. And then he comes to this third parable. And it's though he's saying that when you live in light of the kingdom, it's not enough just to purify your lives and not live evil and abusive lives. It's, it's not just enough to watch and prepare for the coming kingdom as those virgins did. When you live in light of the kingdom, you are one that is working and that God finds working when He comes back with His kingdom. We take His resources and, and, and we do what they were created to do. We, we do with them what they were created for. Again, we are His workmanship. We were prepared for good works. And so when He comes back, He finds us actively working, ready for kingdom life. The first thing that we need to notice about this parable as it relates to serving our God and, and giving Him our best, we need to recognize who these talents belong to. Look at verse uh, 14 there, Matthew 25 and 14. He says, It's going to be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them his property. It was his property. In verse 27, he reiterates, he says, You ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. Who, who owns these resources? When we think back to the beginning, when there was nothing, absolutely nothing, except for God and three persons. And that's all that there was. And there was nothing else. Formless, void, only God. And then God began to create. Out of His will, for His purposes, He began to create. And He created every single thing that we see here today. It should be absolutely obvious that then everything that we see today belongs to Him. There was nothing, and then He created for His purposes. And so, me, I belong to God. My resources belong to God. My influence and my intellect belongs to God. Every, my home, my children, everything belongs to God. And so this parable begins, and what we have here is the story of Jesus' departure from the earth. We have the master who leaves for a time. And then it says in verse 19 that after a long time, the master returns. Some were very confused when Jesus left because they thought that he was coming right back. Uh, Paul writes a, a letter to the Thessalonians. And it was almost like the Thessalonians were just sitting on a hillside somewhere waiting for Jesus to come back. And, and Paul has to tell the Thessalonians, look, 
if you won't work, then you can't eat. You, you, you've got to keep on carrying on with your lives. You can't just sit around waiting for Jesus to come back. And, and it made it pretty clear here in this parable that it was going to be a long time that the master was gone. And, and what we're left with in the, in the meantime is we're taking what is his, his resources, the things that belong to him, and we are stewarding them in the meantime. We are using them, but make no, no mistake, they belong to him. And so as, as those who manage the resources of God, what do we do with them? Well, Peter lays it out in 1 Peter 4. Peter says, as each one has received a gift, you use it to serve one another. As good stewards of God's varied grace, whoever speaks, you speak as the oracles of God. Whoever serves, you serve by the strength that God supplies in order that God may be glorified. We are stewards of these things that belong to God. And we use them to the glory of God as He has gone for a long time, but He is returning. And we recognize that everything belongs to Him. Sometimes when we talk about stewardship, we, we refer really just to that 10% that we put in the plate. Stewardship is the recognition that everything belongs to God. All of me, all that I have. There's a problem with that though. Because it's easy enough to look around and think... Well, then why do some people have more of God's stuff than others? Why do I not have as much as so-and-so else? And it's not just money. I mean, some people are just more talented. Some people have greater abilities. Some people have a, a deeper faith. We look around and, and why do I not have the same stuff that others have from God? And that's the second thing that we need to recognize from this parable is that God doesn't work in portions. God works in proportions. Everything belongs to God, but He doesn't work in even portions. He works in proportions. Look again to verse 15. He said, To one He gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to His ability. And then He went away. Uh, the video just illustrates this perfectly uh, because I think in all the ways that matters, the one who won on that day was the kid that came in last. We're not really great judges about who's winning sometimes. I think that was pretty obvious. But we can get to feeling like, why do I have less? Why do I have less when in God's economy, He's, he's saying, child, you're winning. Child, you are doing exactly what I created you to do. When I look around my life and I look at others and I, and I say, why don't I have what they have? Why don't I have the faith that they have? Why don't I have the easy life, that's a joke, that they have? Why, why do I have the problems that I have? Why do I have the lack that I have? And I don't know why I am where I am. I need to remember God does know why I am where I am. God knows exactly why I have or don't have what I have or don't have. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 18, Paul says, But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as He chose, as it seemed good to Him. There's this uh, story in Acts chapter 3 where Peter and John are going up to the temple to pray. And as they walk in the entrance, they come across a beggar. Now later on in the text it will tell us that this man had been lame for over 40 years. So you can just imagine how long this man has been sitting here, his friends taking him to the door of the temple, the, the entryway, day after day, in the hot sun and the cold, begging day after day. But finally one day Peter and John are walking by and he begs of them. And Peter says, I'm not going to give you silver or gold. I don't have that. But I will give you what I do have. In the name of Jesus, rise and walk. And this man begins to leap and run around and people take notice. And all of a sudden there's a crowd forming and Peter's able to preach the gospel and more and more people come to Jesus. And because of this, Peter and John are arrested and they're brought before the council. And now also this man who was lame is brought in before the council. And he's standing right there. Now this guy's been at the temple gate for over 40 years. Do you think they recognized him? They walked by him all the time. I used to work downtown in Birmingham. And there was plenty of homeless that would be around my, my workplace. And I didn't know them, but I knew them. You know, I've seen that guy. I see him every day. 
Well, all of a sudden, all these council members are looking at this guy that they know is lame. He wouldn't have been sitting there for 40 years if he wasn't. And now he's standing there. How amazing to be that guy. I mean, how cool would that be? If you got to be that guy and have your name written in the Bible, touching lives for over 2,000 years, I'd sign up for that, right? If you had to be lame for 40 years, would we still sign up for that, though? And that, that's the thing. God needs one-talent men and one-talent women in His kingdom. He uses them in very special ways. And we get hung up on all the, why, why don't I have? Why am I not five-talent? Why am I not at least two-talent in this area of my life? When God's saying, you have no idea what powerful, powerful things I'm going to use you. You have influence that others don't have. You reach into places and you spread my good news and my name in places that others can't. We, we don't need to ca get caught up on why we don't have what we don't have. God places the members in the body just as it pleases Him. You look at that boy, and uh, I, I mean, I've, I can't tell you how many times I've watched this video and, and cry every single time. There's no shame in that. There's no shame in crying. Uh, the, the guy on the video said that it had 800,000 hits. That's an old video, by the way. If you look today, it's got 7.4 million hits on that video. I can't imagine what that boy felt like when he was running that race. He had no concept uh, of how far it would go. And, then, and just to know that through his infirmity, he has touched 7.4 million people. I mean, we just have no concept of what God is doing through us, even in our weakness. And he's given us what we can handle. If he put the responsibility of an apostle on you, it might burn you out. Can't handle it. If you're a two-talent or a three-talent person, he puts a one-talent responsibility in your lap, it might bore you. You get tired of it. But he is so wise, he gives us each exactly what we can handle. He puts us exactly in the places that he knows he needs us. And so we are his for his purposes. I am... Um, I brought a little coin up here with me. We uh, had the blessing of going to Jerusalem uh, back in 2014, and I picked this up on a street corner. Kind of 99% sure it's fake, but um, it's, a, it's a lepta is what they call it. Some called it a mite. Jesus says one of the greatest gifts that would ever, was ever given was two of these. It's, it's not how much we are. It's in whose hand we are. And, and one talent, two talent, five talent. He works in proportions, not in portions. And He made us that way because it pleases Him. Lastly, as we run this race, uh, this parable helps us to understand that how we think of God determines how we run our race. The, the image that I have of God, what I think about His character and His attitude, that determines how I'm going to run my race. Again, in uh, verses 24 through 25, it says that He also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you didn't sow, gathering where you scattered no seed, so I was afraid. We put those two together. I knew that you were hard, so I was afraid. And I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what's yours. Is God just waiting to bust you? Is that who God is? Is God just waiting to pull you over? Is that the way that I think of God? Or is God cheering for you? Is God your biggest fan? Is God that mom or dad that just gets to the level of embarrassing because they're cheering so hard from the stands, Mom, quit it, quit it, Mom. What, what is God? Is God just waiting to bust you or is God cheering for you? Are you afraid that God just wants to catch you in a failure? You know, sometimes I think in my own faith life I have missed the father-son relationship. I've forgotten to look at God in that way. And it matters greatly because there is a fatherly loyalty from God to His children. F fathers owe their children a, a duty of loyalty. Um, 
you know, y'all know I've got two sons, I've got four daughters. There's not a single one of them that could do anything to lose my love. Not a single one of them, if I came home and I told them that day, you better take out the trash, I'm going to be so mad if you don't take out the trash because I told you three days in a row. And I get there and the trash is still exactly where it was when I left in the morning. There's not a single one of them. I'm going to say, okay, that's it. I mean, I've told you, I don't know how many times, now you're out. You're out. It doesn't work work that way. There's discipline in the house. That's the way God's house works as well. There's there's discipline within the house, but there's also a duty of fatherly loyalty where he is loyal to that relationship. He's not just waiting to break that relationship the first chance he gets. John 8 and 35, the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. And what we're not we're not talking about, well, you can never be lost then. Hey, sons can leave the house. The prodigal left the house. He was outside of the father's house for a time. But you know what the father said as soon as he came back? He walked up that road rehearsing his story. I just, I just want to be a slave. I just want to be a slave. All your hired servants, they, they're better off than I am now. If you could just bring me back as a slave. And the father had to get through his head. Son, don't you know you're not a slave? You are a son. And all the rights that go with sonship, they are yours. Come on, kill the fatted calf. Put the shoes on his feet. Put the ring on his finger. He's my son. We are sons. God loves us. It's an absurdity to think of a father that's just waiting to kick the children out of the house. There's a duty of care and loyalty, and we understand this. We know loyalty. We know grace. We like to think of ourselves as loyal and graceful people. I'm loyal to my wife. She's loyal to me. For better or for worse, right? We're loyal to our children. We're loyal to our football team. I mean, I'm an Alabama fan, and it's been good. It's been real good for the last decade. I think it was 2002 through 2007, we lost to our rival every single year, six years running. We had some bad years. I mean, I look across, it really doesn't miss any of us. If you're an Auburn fan, you can think of similar periods in your history. If you're a Tennessee fan, God bless you, and you're going to get back one day. I know you will. I hope you do. We don't just jet when things get hard. We know loyalty. We like to think of ourselves as loyal people. But sometimes we forget where we got that from. Sometimes we think of ourselves as more loyal than God is, and that's a big mistake. God is a father. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be all over it. If God had a car, it would be a crazy amount of bumper stickers on that car bragging on you. If God had an iPhone, he'd be that granddad showing all your pictures to anybody that walked by. God is proud to be your God. And that's not said lightly. He knows you. He knows what you've done. He knows you inside and out, every single thought and action. And that's still the kind of God that He is. He is proud to be your God. He is loyal to His relationship with you. And that means all the world when I think about giving my best. Well, I want to give my best to that kind of a God. I want to give my best when I recognize that everything in my hands, it's not mine, it's His. How good He's been to put it in my hands. Who am I to carry the things of God? Who am I to carry the the, the wisdom that He's put into my life and the influence? Who am I to get caught up looking at what I don't have and what so-and-so has that I don't? Man, I'm just so blessed to have a wise God that put me exactly in this universe where He knew that He needed me. He had a game plan that included my name, and He put me in the exact right place. And He loves me. He, he's not waiting to, to kick me out, man. He's just cheering me on. I can give my best to that kind of God. I just imagine myself as that boy. Can, can you just imagine for a moment what it would have been like to be Him, limping around that long track, Limbs aching. You got to know your last. Of course he knew he was last. Not, not just last, but way dead last. You know where you are. You know who you are. 
you going through some difficulties and some struggles, just, or just what would it have been like to have been in his shoes? But if you could just see the Father on the sidelines, man, tears down the Father's face, heart bursting with pride over his Son. We need to keep our eyes on the Father. Let's give our best. If you would, please pray with me. Father, we are so honored to be servants in your kingdom, but more than servants, to be sons in your house. Father, we, we just pray that you would teach us, that you would train us up, that you would fill our lives with your spirit. Give us, give us all we need to do those works that you prepared for us before the world was created, that you had in mind for us. Father, teach us not to look side to side, but to, just to look to you, to not get caught up in comparing ourselves against five talent or two talent sons and daughters of yours, but to be so thankful that you put us right where you did. Father, help us to often be reminded that there's nothing that we have that isn't yours, that it all belongs to you, that you created it each item, every single thing that you created. You created it with a purpose to bring glory back to yourself. Father, teach us to treat every single thing in this universe as objects that bring glory to you, not objects that bring gratification to ourselves to be used on our flesh, but that this whole creation is to be used to give glory back to you. And Father, just teach us your heart. Father, as we serve you, help us to know you and to carry the right image of you in our minds, not as a, a Father that is just waiting to judge us on our poor performance, but as a Father that loves us and roots us on and cheers for us and, and is just so proud to have us as sons and daughters. Father, we, we know our works. We, we know the fact that we have fallen short many times and that we don't deserve that kind of love. But Father, we don't judge you based on ourselves. You are who you are. You are a great, loving God, and we praise you for that. And we just pray that you would continually remind us and bring us back to that truth about who you are and what our identity is in you. Father, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. And amen. So good to be church with you. If there's any in our church family, if there's any at all here today that, that need help with anything, that need to prayers for anything, need an arm around your shoulder for anything, we're here for you, we love you, we love to pray with you and for you. If there's anybody here that's far from God, anybody that's not a Christian, and you want to give your life to Him, won't you do that today? Put it in His hands. He is a good and capable Father, and you can be His today. In faith, reaching out, being baptized, having all your sins forgiven, taken off your shoulders. That can be your reality today. Won't you come if you need to come as we stand and we sing?